Okay, now we are recording. Hi, everybody. This is David P. France, and I'm coming to you from Basel, Switzerland. Before we get the interview started, I want everyone out there who is watching our videos to like the videos, subscribe to the YouTube and Vichu channel, and tell your friends and family what we're up to. Share the videos, like the videos. This is David P. France TV, and we are a platform for creators and creative people. And we we profile feature artists, writers, dancers, thought leaders, small business owners, entrepreneurs. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking to someone who I've been in contact for, I think we've been in contact for years, yep. um, back and forth. And finally, there's an opportunity here where we can have a, a sit down conversation about what he is up to. This is Damien Simon. Damon Simon is a renowned musical composer, author, and guest lecturer who has written dozens of scores for multiple genres and sizes of groups all around the world. Um, Damien is a graduate of the Purchase Conservatory in New York and the University College of Dublin in Ireland. And he guest lectures at dance conservatories. He also consults um, with audiences about how, or dance audiences, maybe theater as well, about how to collaborate when creating art. And he's consolidated his lectures into, how do you say, into a book called The Collaboration. Collaboration. And this book seeks to help others create well together. Damien, thank you for uh, making time and um, coming here to speak with us Thanks, about David. what you're up to. Thank you for having me, David. Great. Yeah. Tell us, like, we're going to go all the way from the beginning, right? Because, you know, I think for the last, I don't know, it's been years that I've known uh, about you. Even before I started this, this, this YouTube channel, I think it was when I was, when I first moved to Switzerland, which was in 2011, 12, right? Where That's I think, a long time. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and at that time I had started a dance company but I was in no shape to, to hire independent people and do all of the, you know, fancy things that, you know, higher level dance companies were doing. Tell us how you started with um, your, your, your work and then, you know, bring us up to what you're up to now. I know that's a big, that's a big yeah, well, jump, right? Yeah, I want to go way back to the beginning. Uh, I need to go back to the beginning back. because we lay this foundation so people can understand how you came into this uh, particular type of work. Hey, uh, kid across the street from me when I was 14, uh, Jesse, he offered me his beat up old guitar. I said, do you want the guitar? I said, I'll take the guitar. Didn't know how to play it, but I took it. So uh, at that point in my life, I was into a lot of punk rock, hardcore bands in New York, um, originally from Buffalo. And uh, I said, I'm gonna start a band. So I started a hardcore band in the basement of my house, you know, punk rock in the 80s, and then uh, moved on to playing jazz in the jazz band in high school. And then my senior year of high school, I decided, you know, I want to do this for the rest of my life. So I applied and auditioned for the Purchase Conservatory, which is just uh, near Yonkers, just north of uh, New York City, and I got in. So uh, the degree I was studying there was for um, studio composition, writing, uh, working in and out of recording studios, various different genres of music and uh, different mediums. Uh, so I discovered, because the Purchase Conservatory had multiple conservatories within it, you know, dance conserv conservatory, uh, acting, music, art, fine art, things like that. And uh, I got thrown into the dance conservatory with, from, from friends. So dancers started coming to me, asking me to write pieces of music for either their recitals or their class projects throughout the years. And I got really, really, really hooked on that I would say junior year uh, at Purchase. And that's, from then on, that's all I was doing. I eventually finished up at Purchase and went to grad school at University College of Dublin, where I continued to work with uh, dance companies and dancers there. Uh, very famous choreographer from Scotland, Gavin Dorian, I worked with him for a bit in Dublin. And then eventually finished up uh, my graduate degree and came back to the States and just started working with companies all throughout North America. You know, reaching out, you know, 
a lot of talking. It's like you have to be a used car salesman at a certain point. You know, you got to sell yourself, sell yourself, and sell yourself. And I do other mediums. I've done like short films. Uh, I've done a lot of theater. And I've worked with different ensembles, whether it be a chamber orchestra or just, you know, duets or quartets or quintets and most scores for them as well. But my main focus, what I'd love to do the most with my music is write for that dance medium. I love writing for ballet. I love writing for contemporary dance. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty much where it is now. All right. So look, we're going to dial back. When you had the interest in punk music in the 80s, I mean, so... <laughs> What was it about punk music that held your interest? I mean, and how did you okay. go from punk rock in a band, right, to, I mean, did you say, okay, I'm going to go to school for music because I think it's, you know, I, I need to, to know how to write. I need to know how, I mean, describe no, it was, your it was, thought process. There was process no intentional interest. movement whatsoever. Nothing so really there, was yeah. no there was no intentional movement whatsoever. Not a billion years would I ever think, you know, one day I'm at a Dead Kennedys concert, and then uh, 30 years later, I'm writing a score for a chamber orchestra for some of the best players in Florida. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would never thought that in a million years, you know. Uh, I have had, I've seen um, shows of mine live in Austria. I've seen shows of mine live in Russia, with, you know, with ballet dancers. Would I ever thought, think that? No way. You know, I have the Blue Mohawk. I was a kid around with the ripped jeans and the spiked chains and uh, and stuff all over them, you know. But what what is there? Could you describe the kind of music you talked about, Dead Kennedys, or? Oh yeah, what, yeah. What, 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 what was the what was the the actual playlist and yeah, the playlist during that time in the eighties, just to give people. Oh, um, so like it's some like my, my favorite bands and things yes, like that. Yes. Yeah, bands like you know, like uh, Seven Seconds, uh, Dag Nasty. Uh, Crow Mags, uh, Youth of Today. You know, I also played a, a bands I had in high school. We played out a lot. So I think that was another thing that threw me further into that music realm and they, just get more, you know, what do you call legitimate, serious music? Is I was on stage like once or twice a month from the time I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. My bands actually played out. We played clubs and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a huge rush for me. And that also pushed me to learn more, to practice more, to get better at my craft. And then I think there's just a natural movement to more, you know, what people consider quote unquote serious music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think it's, uh, it's important because, you know, now let's say the popular music, what, what, what is popular now seems to be rap, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> when I look at the the, the, the the music awards and they the rap is now a serious category, it makes me it just makes me pause a bit, right? So even the music that is not considered really serious has yeah. now become right. Oh yeah, that's the, that's the money maker now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so when you arrived at the school, how did you get from, okay, when you said you were placed into this program with all the dances, describe sort of the, the, the different categories of the, of the program for music, just so it's clear. So uh, at purchase of that conservatory, you obviously have um, individual instruments degrees, you know, a classical guitar degree, a violin degree, but you also had a voice degree. You also had a studio composition, and composition degrees. Okay, a composition degree was strictly based on pen, piece of paper, because there were no computers back then, and writing out your scores for various instruments. Mm -hmm. The studio composition degree back then was, that was part of it. There was also part of learning how to record um, the guitar, drums, bass, in a recording studio, professional recording studio. So we had a mix of everything. And that's one thing that attracted me to that studio composition degree. But like I said, when you're, you're in a community, and at that time at Purchase, I think there was 1,200 students, that's it. So you have 1,200 students that 99% of them are hardcore, serious, fine art students. They're there to become a ballet dancer. They're there to become an actor. They're there to be a, com a composer. So they are hardcore what they do, and that's all they do. Mm -hmm. So, and you're all around each other. So you end up having, making friendships, having conversations, and collaborating back then was not as big and popular as it is now. So back then, you know, you, if you, I sat down with a, a dancer or a choreographer and say, hey, you know, let's do something together. 
a lot of times there was like, okay, I'd love to, but I don't know how to do this. Some of them get scared. They wouldn't know how to communicate like with me. And uh, in my book, The Collaboration, I have a, a, a section where that's explained how to do that, how to go about that. Just 100% communication with other people. And then you can work things out. But just learning what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. So then I started working with these dancers and these choreographers and then just one, then to another one, then to another one. And just kept going and going and going. And then seeing my music, whether it be live or taped, uh, being performed to on a stage, in a studio, whatever, you know, that, that for me, that brings out my music more than anything else. Mm. I can sit there and write a, a score all day long, you know, in my uh, studio at home. But when I see it's, someone's using it as with a medium, seeing what they get out of it, yeah. what type of choreography they get out of it, what type of emotion they get out of it, that means the most to me. Yeah. So, okay, so you, 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 you complete the program in, in the United States. How did, how did you get to, to Ireland? I mean, how did this happen? Yeah, you know, I mean, for people that don't know, I mean, this is not, this is, this is not something that, oh, okay, I just, and then I went to yeah, Ireland. In particular, in particular, I think in the 80s or in early 90s, whatever, this is unusual because most okay. people who are American, they're staying in the States. Mm -hmm. yeah, so for you to get this opportunity to go to Ireland, how did this trans uh, I come from I come from a very um, long-standing Irish family in New York. Uh, so the, that, that, that's my culture, first mm -hmm. of all. But mm -hmm. also my uh, department director, uh, Jim McElwain, he noticed that I had an, uh, I don't say odd, a different affinity for ethnic musics. Meaning when, when I write my scores, a lot of times the melody lines sound, has some sort of ethnicity to it, whether it be Irish, whether it be uh, a German, whether it be um, you know, Hebrew, something that's got, I, I like to work with other cultures, lines of theory, mm -hmm. um, scales, interpretations of those scales and things like that. And Jim McElwain noticed that and he, he literally, I remember the day he pulled me aside in the hallway in a music building and he said, I, I need you to go do your master's in Europe. So obviously I wasn't gonna go, well, I'm saying obviously, I didn't wanna to go to a, a non-English speaking country and I, don't know, I come from an Irish family. So Dublin, gone, let's go. So he wrote, I don't know if he wrote a letter called the school and said, hey, I got this student and he wants to do his uh, post-grad at your place. And they let me mm -hmm. in. I was the only, I was the first non-Irish person to do that program. Yeah, I figured. Yeah. There's only there's only four of us in the whole program, which is funny. So you mean four four people students. in the entire four people in the entire program, and then you were the only American at that yes. of the four. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I at least I want to bring that up because you know in this uh, business of um, dance and art, I mean, you know, I'm I'm here in Switzerland, right? And part of the reason why I'm here, there's a whole another story, which I have given people bits and pieces of, but, you know, my success, if you want to call it that, really started moving when I moved out of the United States. Mm -hmm. So I'm sensitive to this sort of, this exchange, and I think it's key, right? And now you're working with, with a lot of, or you have worked with a lot of European yes. um, artists and, and uh, yeah. arts organizations and so on. So to, to get back, so, so you return you complete the degree in Dublin, and then you return to what part of the country in the United States? I moved back to Buffalo, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, I had gotten a call from a theater director in Buffalo before I finished up school. And he wanted me to come back to Buffalo and write scores for his theater company, a small theater company in downtown Buffalo. Mm -hmm. So I'm simply like, oh, I'm... 23 years old, yeah, I mean, first like out of school, great professional theater job, writing scores. For and I wrote a lot of scores for them. Uh, that relationship dissolved. Um, and, but I just kept jumping back into more dance companies, you know, dance companies in New York, dance companies in Boston, wherever I could find them. Uh, back then, you know, the internet and everything like that was very small. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of legwork, a lot of actual phone calls making and stuff like that and getting people's addresses and mailing out, you know, music on, on CDs and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so could you, could you describe what your process is, let's say, 
in the earlier days and how you did this, the actual com composition of the music and take us through sort of what's happening or what's happened in the last, how many years that you've been doing this? It's been a while. So initially, yeah. for example, when you finally got these, um, these jobs or these, these, these opportunities, what is the process like early on? right out of you know Dublin right out of uh, of, of graduate school that, that was like you know uh, walk stumble walk stumble walk stumble you know when you're brand new and stuff like that you you don't know the 100 percent way you're going to do this process and you have to deal with other personalities other artistic personalities as well so for instance uh when I moved back to Buffalo and I was writing the scores for that theater company <clears throat> the director of the theater company might sit down and we'd go over a script and you go, okay, I want some music here, music here, music here. And, and me, I'm going, you know, at that point, I was so green at it that I just say, yes, okay, whatever you want, whatever you want. So I really didn't make any comments. Just gave them what they wanted. I'll just shut up and be in the court. <laughs> so there you, there you mm -hmm. go. So uh, that, that became, um, I want to say frustrating, but it was definitely learning, a really, really big learning opportunity. Because it's, well, you know, you, you put everything on paper, but then when you, are there at the actual production, you know, you're, you're going, oh, shouldn't have mm -hmm. done that. I should put that over there, that music there, and that music there. And you learn, it's just like any other field. The, the, the more you do it, the more you learn how to do it better to make it um, better for the audience, better for the, the, the production people, better for the writer themselves. Uh, the one thing, the fun thing about working at the theater company when I first started with them was, they had, were getting scripts from all around the country. So I've done, you know, I've worked with uh, writers in California, role play, playwright in California, playwriters in Arizona, playwriters in, in Toronto, and things like that. So all these people would submit their scripts and to the ex executive producer of the, the company itself. And then he would come to me and say, okay, let's put some music to this. And, yeah. and when I say music, we're not talking about musical type music. We're talking more of like incidentals. Yeah. You know, incidental music, like mood music and things is, you know, uh, 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 but yeah, it brings yeah. it, it brought out a lot of the story itself. Right. And so let's say um, now you are living in Orlando, is that correct? Yes, I'd be moving yeah. soon now. Yeah. yeah. What was, what's, what, what brought you to Orlando? How did that? Um... That was um, uh, my best friend and his wife back in Buffalo. Uh, she got transferred with her company, Tom to Orlando, and they bugged me for months. They said, you can do whatever you want. You can do what you do wherever you want to in the world. Uh, okay. We're moving to Orlando. You know why? There's no snow there. I, I love Buffalo, but my knees are getting a little too old for shoveling. Mm. So we, I moved down here. Uh, they were here a few months, and I came down and checked out the place. And Orlando has got a really thriving um, artistic community here. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I've done a lot of work here and out of here, being based in Orlando. Mm -hmm. but like mm -hmm. I said, I'm moving to St. Augustine in a couple of weeks to moving the whole system up there. Yeah. And what? why St. Augustine is, I mean, I've heard of, of St. Augustine. I hear that it's very... It's, um, it's uh, I love, uh, I love the city there. It's on the water. Right, yeah. uh, Orlando has got, you know, you got man-made lakes here and there, but I want to be by the ocean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get my retirement money. <laughs> uh, yeah, see. So let's say, for example, if um, someone comes to you and says, hey, I need a score, like I say, hey, and, you know, what is the process? How can you, um, could you take us through the process of how you, uh, what do you call it, evaluate or how you, all right, I, I'm someone who's green, as you, you would just say, inexperienced. Um, I'm out of, a dance program. I'm now a choreographer, that sort of thing. And I say, I need some, I need music, right? What, what is the process? Well, the first thing that comes, which is the, the sad thing that has to be done this way, is the financial aspect, you know, mm -hmm. because it, it is a business. <clears throat> so uh, you come to me as a choreographer and say, hey, Damien, I love your work. I want you to do a score for me. The first thing I'm going to ask you is, what's it for? Meaning, is it a, a one-off piece? Is it a touring piece? Is it a uh, non-touring, non-one-off piece? Is it gonna run for a while? Is it not gonna run for a while? What's it for? That way I can gauge um, 
your budgetary needs for it. Then I'm gonna say, how long is the piece? So don't, right there, what's it for and how long is the piece? That's when I can give you a financial number of what it would cost to write the piece. And then say you agree. Now I got a slew of new questions. Uh, is there any specific instrumentation you want? Is there any tempo of the piece you want? Does the piece have a story behind it? And what is it? If it doesn't have a story behind it, what is the mood, you know, the, the feeling, the emotion of the piece that you want to be portrayed musically? Mm -hmm. And we go through that. And I can, I've actually gotten to the point where I've gotten really, really specific on even time signatures and key signatures. Some, because uh, some choreographers like, well, I really like to do it like a, a waltzy six, eight time, something like that. Or mm -hmm. someone, I just stand there four, four time. Uh, <clears throat> and then I'll get all that information from them. And then I'll say, okay, listen, I have this SoundCloud page that has like 30 scores on it, in various different genres of scores. I made sure I put those on it. Go to that site or go to my, my own website because I have a lot of scores on my own website. And um, if there's something there that you like, that idea, that feeling, uh, that instrumentation, that tempo, write it down and we'll talk about it. Now, if there's a score, which this has happened before in the past as well, someone's come to me with scores before, and I, I've done that. I sent them to my website or the SoundCloud uh, page, and they said, no, I want that score, that one specifically. And I'm like, ooh, good, job's done. <laughs> so then you, that's when you base uh, a licensing fee off. Of. So they're not paying for the full writing of the score, they're just paying for the licensing of the score for however long they need it for. Mm -hmm. So if I'm writing a brand new score with them, I've said, okay, I got all the information I need from you. I go away. I go away for how long it, long it takes me. And I say, I'm gonna come back with you with uh, two minutes of music. I'll send them an MP3 of two minutes of what I think we both agree on. Mm -hmm. And then we go from there. Am I going in the right direction? Am I going in the wrong direction? Do you want to change something where you a little not sure about what you don't want it, but now you know? Because I've had that, that happen a lot too as well with uh, choreographers. I, they tell me it's very detailed specifics on what they want musically. And I go away and to my best ability, I give it to them. They listen to it later, the MP3, like two minutes of it. And then they go, oh, you know what? Totally changed my mind. Let's start from scratch. <laughs> and I, I, I have no problem with that. I, I'm a writer, you know what they say about you know, authors. Writers mm -hmm. write, you know? Right. So I, I'm constantly, constantly writing new scores for no reason but to write them and practice. For me, that's like, you know, it's practicing and practicing and practicing. So then I turn around, I'm a catalog of, you know, dozens of scores that no one's ever heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who knows if they ever will hear. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's say, for example, what, what are some of the issues that, I mean, I think if I say, well, at two minutes in, um, oh, can you rewrite it or whatever, is it, does that cost extra or, you know, in terms of, the budget, I, how do you normally handle that? Yeah, that, that comes down to me you know, under the umbrella of editing. Mm -hmm. uh, I give, there's, okay, first of all, normally a choreographer or artistic director will have a timeline themselves. They'll say, okay, this needs to be done within two weeks. So I put that in my head as well as how much it's going to cost, you know, to write the score, to commission that score, how much the person is going to be. That's put in with it. So because now you're limited on time to edit things mm -hmm. okay so there's going to be no matter what happens there's going to be time when there's going to be something that's not 100 percent you love okay it's going to happen uh i've written scores and you know a year later i look back and listen to them going oh what was i thinking mm -hmm. <laughs> you know I mean, you, you change your mind or you listen to them more uh you know profusely let's say uh but editing i i this Limiting my editing with choreographers, that has been relatively new, like within the last 10 years. I let them know, okay, you can't go crazy with editing. I did a score 13 years ago uh, with a choreographer in New York. 11-minute uh, score, chamber orchestra, for a dance company. I was on texting or on the phone with him three, four times a day. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, he got it. Got to the point where he would say, "Okay, measure thirty-six. No, uh, no, no, can you get? Can you just get rid of that kick drum?" And I'm like, okay. no, "No, no, no, no." Yeah, exactly. Yes, I got to the yeah. point. I said, "Listen, you what you need to do is you need to listen to whatever I give you, and you need to make a big list." That's right. 
just make that list and email it to me and that's it. But mm -hmm. I'm not going to keep, I did a score for a uh, filmmaker. And <laughs> this one was, this one was really crazy. So I'm scoring his movie and uh, I gave him this nice grandiose score. I thought it fit perfectly. So he comes in and he's with his uh, assistant, director assistant, whatever. So two of them are listening, watching the movie. I'm, this actually this computer right here, and <laughs> listening to the score, and they're cutting it and cutting it and cutting it and cutting yeah. it down, cutting it down, cutting it down, cutting it down. And, and it ended up being like three instruments in the whole movie. <laughs> and I yeah. had like a chamber orchestra. Yeah. So sometimes you just gotta say, stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, look, uh, tell us what, if there are any differences, but what, what it's like to, to score for a ballet company versus let's say music for chamber, chamber music, because this is a whole nother genre. Like in other words, give people an idea of the breakdown or breakdown rather the difference between the different art forms. So ballet company, that's one thing. Let's say opera, like I know that there, I have some people who are connected to opera and opera companies and stuff. So I intend to yeah. show them this video as well. You know, if you can give us an idea, suppose an opera company comes, or let's say it's one of these chamber music orchestras. How? How? That's, it's an easy one on that. It's and that's uh, you know, let's, just com let's compare like a chamber music, chamber orchestra score to a ballet company score. Yeah. Okay. So a chamber, okay. and this is just purely the way I write. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to make judgment how other people write. You write the way you write. But the way I write with the chamber orchestra piece, I'm writing the music for the purpose of writing the music. Okay, there's no story as far as I'm concerned behind this. This is what's coming out of me. This is a score that's flowing out of me. Me personally, no specific emotional reason, no story. It's just I'm trying to make the prettiest music I want to make. Ballet company, now that's a whole set of other things. Now I have to deal with the story an emotional effect that I'm getting from the choreographer. All this with, with all this I love as well, as well as movements, okay? A lot of times choreographers will show me, tell me or show me what type of movement they'll have in the choreography. So I can pretty much write that score showing that movement within the score as well. Mm -hmm. you know, showing dramatic movements, uh, group movements, solo movements. So I'm able to put that music to that specific scene. Whereas in a chamber orchestra piece, there's no scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have to think visually in the ballet aspect, whereas the chamber orchestra music, I don't. Yeah. Now, yeah. it's interesting because let's say in my limited experience as a choreographer, because I, have, I've, I mean, I've done this many years ago, right? So when you and I first started corresponding, I think that was around 2000. I remember getting something from you 2011 and 2012, I think. Mm -hmm. And part of what we were doing is <laughs> I was given the task to, on this one specific job, uh, on the, this is how I did it. This is how I did it. Let's backtrack. So it's similar to how you pitch music to people. How uh, you you become a salesman? I heard someone who I think was part of a Greek Orthodox orchestra, or there was a, he was the conductor, and he had organized this this show every year with the Greek Orthodox Community Center in Queens, New York. So I looked. This is how I did it. I looked at the number of seats. <laughs> in the actual theater mm -hmm. as a determining factor to pitch him. Because I said, if he's got 600 seats and he does this every year, here's an opportunity, right? So, so I pitched him and he came back to me and I ended up flying to Greece and meeting him in Athens when there was like, you remember when the banks started to, to go a little haywire in, in Athens or in Greece? Oh, and yeah, yeah, everything, yeah. there were strikes and stuff. This is the time that I flew in and I flew in at night. But the, the, and he was in Greece, but he actually was doing this show in Queens with the, 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 Amer the, the, the Orthodox community there. And he was doing classical music. So my job was I had to choreograph 
to classical music that was well known within mm -hmm. those circles. Now, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. The only thing that I could do was, I mean, I, I didn't say I, I, I winged it, right? Because I was pulling from, you know, previous experiences, but I did not necessarily know how it was going to translate to the people. Now, and, uh, you know, we did well. And it was just two of us, mm -hmm. right? So it was me and one other dancer. But I literally, what was interesting is that I could figure out that this whole thing was going to work because I could produce in my head what the result was going to be, even though I had, I was not the orchestra. Mm -hmm. So I met the guy. I kind of sensed what was going on with him. Then I went to the rehearsal. I told the people, I, I, I told the singers, I said, you got to come to the dance rehearsal. All right, you have to come. There was one woman who was sort of bossy, one of the singers. She ended up, I had to kind of, you know, work with her and it ended up working well, right? But still at the end, I then said, okay, there's nothing coming up out of this. <laughs> I need to do this whole process again. You see what I mean? And this was, it got to be a bit much. So I started to scale down a bit. So for people like you who are doing this for a living, you know, hats off to you because it is an arduous process. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's definitely a process. And people, people, music people, people that uh -huh. you know, play instruments and they're playing rock bands and things and playing orchestras, they don't realize, I mean, when it comes to time, time is a lot longer than people realize. You know, we, a, a minute of music is forever. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, I can't, you know, listen to like a rock band or a pop band. Music, there's a lot of repetition in that. When you have like writing a, a score for like a chamber orchestra for a minute is a really, really long time. So it doesn't, things like that become very arduous, like you say. And when you're doing it for like 20 minutes, you, know, you have to come up with 20 minutes of a score. So. Yeah. I, I, literally, I, I, I literally had to take over the my part of the production because I was like, this is not going to work the way. And I think. <laughs> He didn't have, what he did have, and this is where, you know, I'm laying out the collaboration, but still, after the collaboration was over, I was like, I'm going to have to reteach the whole process again, right? Right? Like, there, it, it was is as if that, that didn't count, if you understand what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. That, it was as if they could not see or he could not see the value of what I brought to the table to help him. Uh -huh. make yeah. that piece work oh yeah that, that whole thing of oh that was great you know good good job yeah, thanks for coming <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and my, my favorite is like, yeah oh can you do this for me this will be great exposure for you <laughs> it's like <laughs> so already making my blood boil just you telling me this because I, I already knew just based on what you were telling me i'm like i already know what this guy's going up against right i mean um my experience is that people are not as educated i guess my point let me get to the point that people are not as educated about what it is that you're actually doing and how your piece, right, is, is critical and important point, uh, mm -hmm. uh, an important point, pardon me, to get to the final, right, product. Oh, yeah, yeah. And especially when it comes to uh, what you're providing the other medium, whether that medium be an you know, uh, uh, acting medium, uh, a film medium, a dance medium, a uh, you know, a performance art medium. I've actually done uh, concerts where I've had painters painting behind me. So people come to the concert to watch these painters paint, create mm -hmm. pieces of art, but they're also there listening to me play. And then that, that adds to the whole experience of that. I did a, um, I did a, a, a documentary years ago in Australia based on, um, their Anzac Day. Anzac in Australia and New Zealand is when they uh, celebrate the soldiers from World War II. Mm -hmm. And a uh, buddy of mine was a filmmaker in Australia and he called me up and said, hey, listen, I'm doing this documentary and it's going to be all interviews with veterans, Australian veterans. And he wanted me to score some music to underline the interview. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, that is a really cool, fun idea. So he sent me the uh, the interviews, and then I just wrote these like mellow little stuff just to make the the, the scenes that they were talking about when they were 
in the war, you know, and in, in, in battle and things like that. And I had this underlying music just to make you visualize it more. Right, make it okay. dramatic, yeah. And then that, and they loved it. Actually, mm -hmm. the, the, I actually saw the premiere of it. This made me laugh because the time difference between, I was living in Buffalo, was I? No, I think I was here in Orlando. But uh, the time difference obviously between here and uh, it was in Sydney, I think it was in Sydney. It's so great that uh, they premiered it on a beach in front of 50,000 people, a massive screen TVs in Australian mm -hmm. beach. And yeah, I just yeah. watched it live on my computer going, oh my God, it's, it's just bizarre. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, tell us, you, you, you've you worked all over the, you've worked with people, you know, all over the globe. Tell us, give us some examples of, um, of companies and people that you've worked with in areas of the world. Let's see, well, I've worked with most, almost every company here in Orlando. On and off. Uh, national wise, uh, I work with John Lair a lot. Uh, score I wrote for him, you know, traveled the world for, geez, forever until the end of the day. And, and, and I, just, I, just, just so you know, who's John Lair? Because I mean, John I don't Lair, know. He's, a, he's, a, he's owns, uh, runs a John Lair dance company uh, in New York, based out of New York. Mm -hmm. um, they're still doing work now, uh, outdoor performances and a lot of video performances. Uh, Michelle. Ulrich Thompson, uh, another choreographer from New York. I've done a lot of work with her. Uh, she's still choreographing a lot. She's actually another, she's a associate professor at Purchase as well, Purchase mm -hmm. Dance. Um, so then, then I've done some work, uh, Kelly Donovan out of Boston. That was way many years ago. Uh, yeah, just lists of people. And then there's also those potential people that we've been like wanting to work together forever. And then that opportunity has arised and then all of a sudden, oh, look at that pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, so yeah. Yeah. so well, that killed I mean, a lot of projects for me. Right. And 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 what are two things that are coming to my mind at the moment you talked um, prior to recording, you talked about your interest in eth ethnic music. Talk a bit about that. But then also, you know, in the second part after that, go into how the pandemic has affected you. So, I mean, I, I didn't get a chance when you talked about your affinity for eth ethnic music. Um, I, that just, I don't know how that came about. Uh, one thing I do tell my students, my composition students, and like, you know, whatever, piano students, guitar students, banjo students, and when I try to teach them how to write as well, write music, little songs, scores, whatever they want to do. And the one thing I always tell them is, you know, okay, let's write this amount of music, and don't forget, I hate boring. Okay, just, you know, if you want to sit there and, you know, a C chord to an F chord to a G chord on your guitar, that's fine. That's very vanilla, but for me, very boring as well. So that whole knowledge is power sort of scenario is, uh, some of my students are really young. My youngest student's like five. My oldest is in their seventies. And I've, you know, taught a lot of touring musicians. They've come to me off the road to just brush up on knowledge and, and ideas. So I give the analogy of like, you know, do you remember your Crayola crayon box and you had like the 12 colors and then the kid across the street had the 64 box color with the little crayon sure. sharpener, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm the one giving you the 64 colors. So sure. involving ethnic musics, I explored that in college a lot. Something just drew me to it because more ideas, different tonality, different scales, uh, more creativity. And also, if you look at, you know, you, when you, you hear an Irish tune, you know it's an Irish tune based on that scale. You know, you may not, your brain knows it. Well, wait, not, so, so give us an example of an Irish tune because, I mean, I don't, I, you, I mean, oh, no, I, I'm I, not, I mean, I don't know necessarily. Okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you the perfect example. Everyone should probably know. Uh, Everybody Danny should boy. know what? Danny Boy. Danny Boy. Okay, alone. okay, 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 yeah. Uh, you're yeah, Danny Boy, you're an Irish washerwoman. Uh, you know, uh -huh. there's like dozens and dozens and dozens. And then you have to go back and look up that one, right? So <laughs> they, they, I mean, the, uh, the music lends itself, the, the, the melodies and the scales lend itself to Irish music. Okay. Let me ask you some off topic question. Like, so when you're talking about um, what's the big uh, dance production that went global and set a whole trend? Am I river dance? Yeah, river dance. So, so, so what is your take based on your knowledge? What is it about that particular? And it's funny you bring that up because uh, that started, that came out when I was living in Dublin. Mm -hmm. I was going to see that came out. 
<clears throat> and I, I love it. I, ridiculously, ridiculously amazing piece of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've ever since that, I want to do my own version of it. Uh, it's a little different though. Riverdance itself, that production itself, focused more on the music than anything else. I want to do a production that big and grandiose, but make it more focused on the dance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And use a lot of, because I enjoy doing it so much, a lot of ethnic type musics within the score. Mm -hmm. So a production like that, traveling from country to country to country, okay, it's in Germany. You have a little hint of German melodies in the score. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, now it's in Portugal, a little hint of Portuguese music. Oh, now it's in Ireland, a little Irish music, a little Japanese music in Tokyo when it goes to Tokyo. So spreading that the um, communal music world with all these specific ethnic feels. Mm -hmm. Riverdance did do that, not to a massive extent. The majority of it was Irish music, but they did hint on multiple times some Spanish music. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, so. Well, there, I, I'll tell you this, and then we're going to go back to what we were just talking about, which is... <laughs> Part of what I'm able to do, and this is a not a lot of people know that I know how to do this. This is the first time I'm devolving this. I can translate through different cultures. Mm -hmm. So musically, I can do it. It's just another form of communication. Yeah. So, so music is communication. Business, in my opinion, is communication. <laughs> it's administration, communication, right? There's, there are languages in almost every field of work, right? So part of what interests me was, okay, how do lawyers talk to one another? How do dancers talk to one another? How do musicians talk to? How do the Portuguese speak to one another? How do the Spanish, right? So to me, all of these are the same, mm -hmm. right? There's a language. Sometimes it's more, you know, physical with the body. Sometimes it's more melodic with the voice. Sometimes it's all symbolic, right? Mm -hmm. So when when everybody's talking about this, you know, when when New World Order, Illuminati, all of these things, political, there's a l language to that as well, which is fascinating. So everything has a language. Everything has a culture. And I think um, part of what I can sense really early on, I can just hear the first couple of bars, they call it, and I know what's going on. It is the, the weirdest thing. Now, how to translate that into a production <laughs> or whatever else, that's the challenge. If there is, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that's part of, but I can also even put myself in the shoes of the person that's actually composing or dancing well that's the whole thing the, the collaboration process that's really that's the number one reason i wrote that book is yeah. because over the years of learning to collaborate with other artistic minds you have to you can't be selfish you know mm. if, if you're working with somebody you cannot be selfish at all and say well this is the way i want it this way it's gonna be it's like, no listen to other people as well because other people might give you great ideas i i have a, a great idea a story about a conductor i work with love this conductor and he was doing, we were in rehearsal, we're on chamber orchestra pieces, and he's at the podium conducting, we're going through the rehearsal of the score, and I'm sitting in the chair next to him, going through the score, you know, page, page one, going. And he seems to uh, Todd, and Todd's like, hey, stops the orchestra. And says, hey, Damien, um, measure 257. Uh, can you maybe do a diviso? Would that be okay between the cellos? And I didn't write it that way. And, and he's like, listen, we'll do, Let's, let's try it. It might sound cool. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like it, we won't do it. Never in a million years would I thought of that idea that yeah. he gave. He tried it. sounded awesome. It didn't change the score. It enhanced the score. So you never know what type of idea someone's going to give you. So being selfish in your thoughts is very detrimental to any sort of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Listening mm -hmm. to other people, someone has always got a good idea somewhere. Yeah. Why not listen? Keep your mind yeah. open. Yeah. So when you talk about going back to the, 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 the river dance, mm -hmm. um, there are some, there's some other element. I mean, we'll have to, I'll investigate. I'll have to do some investigating about how that came about and whether it was like Michael Flatley's, that's his name, right? Oh, he, yeah. No, I know how that came about. 
Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, you know, they still have Eurosong. Remember Eurosong? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, back in 93, it was 93 or 94, I forgot which one. Uh, the composer for Riverdance, the show, he wrote the song for Ireland, for uh, Euro, Eurosong for Ireland. I see. It won. Mm hmm. So then the producers, the, I don't know the names, the big producers for Riverdance went to him and said, hey, let's make a big show out of this. Nice. That's how it happened, yeah. Right, right. And so flatly, it got in front of a, a lot of eyes. And yeah, and flatly at the time, I believe from what I hear, he was working in Vegas as a dancer, <clears throat> an Irish dancer in Vegas. And they called him up because he had won all these like world competitions in the past and said, hey, we want you to do this. We got this great composer, this great show. Boom, let's do it. Hmm. Well, look, um, this is interesting to me. I mean, this is this is this is a once in a lifetime kind of thing for someone like a Michael Flatley, right? No, oh, yeah. And look, um, you know, Dublin is there's there's a lot of material that can come out. I mean, I've been like a couple times, maybe twice. I mean, there's it's a, there's a lot that you can do there. I mean, in terms of I mean, you tell me whether this is right or wrong. I mean, the people tend to be, they understand music, right? It's a its a, an important it's part about, of what's it's happening. A, it's a lyrical country. Yeah. The culture there is, I mean, I mean the greatest poets in the world come from uh, from Ireland, you know, and, and the music. Everyone sings or plays an instrument in Ireland, period. Mm -hmm. Whether they like it or not, they do it, you know. It's, it's, it's just part of being Irish, you know, mm -hmm. sitting in the pub and, and, and going through a session, having like five guys come in with instruments just start playing Randomly, yeah. you know, that's, that's just part of the, the culture there, and it's a, uh, you know, seeing that I come from a very Irish family, you know, McVeigh's, uh, passionate people, <laughs> you know. What is a the name? What is the name? McVeigh. Uh, yeah, McVeigh. That's my mother's maiden name. Uh huh. Yeah. And so the way it goes is like, is that a clan, or, or is that is that is that what you call it, or? Yeah, it... yeah. I think they, yeah, they were originally a clan, uh, uh -huh. but the, very passionate, emotional people, you know, and. Obviously, I knew that from my family to begin with. But then when you live in Ireland for a while, you go, oh, man, yes. Very friendly, passionate people about everything. And um, is there is there anyone else in your family that uh, has pursued music or? No. No. I mean, no. Only, no. What do no. they do? What is the profession? I mean, like everybody, I mean, well, I'm my sure you. I'm at the age my parents are both retired. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure you can trace your, your family back pretty pretty oh, easily. Yeah. Oh yeah, my, well my father my father was a uh, school teacher and, and, and principal. Uh, my mother worked in law enforcement um, before she retired. And I have an older brother who lives out west. Uh, he doesn't play any instruments at all. Uh, the, the thing is, the instrument thing with me, it wasn't like I was following footsteps of people in my family to play an instrument. I understand. I, I, I literally picked up the guitar at 14 so I can pick up girls. I understand. That's, purely, that's the only reason it happened. Because, uh, you know, I, I, I was, well, what, so what, what, in terms of your parents, first generation, second generation, third generation, uh, how many generations have you been uh, in the United States? Oh, my, uh, my great grandfather was uh, moved here from Ireland, I want to say in the 20s or 30s. I have yeah. to check out later that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So it's, it's relatively, I mean, now it's relatively recent. I mean, when we were younger, it was not, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you think about it, I mean, yeah. now it is the 21st century. Yeah. You know? yeah. And now, even when we were coming up, I say, because I was born in 67, I mean, in the relative to the, to, to, it's not so, so long ago, right? I mean, you know, we're in a whole nother genre. Speaking of that, like, what are the challenges that you believe will be coming for people, artists like yourself, um, in this in this day and age, I mean, we're, we 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 brought up the idea of a, the pandemic. How has it impacted you, and what are the challenges? You know, that you see. The pandemic, there's there's so much fear in, in the uh, performing arts because, first of all, like we spoke about earlier, kids coming out of college as the pandemic hits, they had nowhere to go with it. Kids that come at dancers, uh, choreographers, uh, composers, filmmakers, it, they nothing they could do. The whole world shut down for a year, you know? And then people are struggling, so they end up going to a, a, a regular nine to five job, whatever you call it, a day job. I hate that term. Uh, and they might not get back into their arts. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a lot of fear that something like this might hit again and they won't be prepared to live like this again. You know, live in, you know, 
as an artist. You know, not having to worry, I'm, I'm an artist, you know, and not worrying about getting all their art taken away from them. There's that, and there's also the fear of uh, people not willing or able to spend money. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would love to do this show. Like the show I've wanted to do for the last 25 years, I'd love to do it, but I don't have the money for it and I don't know where I'm going to get the money for it. Yeah. You know, things like that. And, um, and taking risks on, and creating something as well, but creating on a really ridiculously tight budget. Okay. So uh, this choreographer is going to do a brand new ballet, but they can't afford to hire a composer like me to write the score for them. So they're going to use canned music from like in Mozart or, or you know, yeah. Chopin or something. So I think the, the fear, people have to get over this fear and hopefully that they will get over the fear once things start to open up more and more and more and more and more. Mm -hmm. I just hope this doesn't cause the creativity of the world to suffer. Yeah. Well, look, um, when I, I'm originally from Maryland, I don't know if you and I spoke about this, my family's from Baltimore, right? So it is very, I come, I, I consider my family as working middle class, if there, if there's such a thing. <laughs> More on the working class than the middle class. <laughs> but um, I laugh because I thought it was middle class coming up, but then years later I realized, no, I'm working class. We were working class, right? So all of my sensibilities come from this perspective. And then we moved to New Jersey when I was a teenager. And then we were 40 minutes outside of New York. So at that particular time, it was the early 80s, which you were, you know, jumping into the punk scene. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was punk. It was well, disco was sort of wasn't really disco anymore, but I was a I was a a club kid wannabe. I couldn't, I wasn't, I couldn't go to New York and, and hang out in the clubs, but I wanted to, and I heard the radio was amazing. And at that time, I think in the 70s, it was really, really bad in New York. And I think the 70s brought on the 80s, which the 80s were fantastic, as you recall, in terms of music. So perhaps, you know, what I'm, you know, getting to is that something similar could be happening Yes, no, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, we don't yeah. know. That's, that's the thing. That's I think that's the biggest problem is that that fear of we don't know if something new is going to happen or yeah. it's going to go back to the way it was or it's going to crash and burn completely. Yeah. Uh, I think there's going to be a big uh, show of force of what's going to happen come the fall once the theater season opens up because the theater season is going to open up on schedule this year. When is and, it opening up? Do you know? It's in uh, New York, right? It's it's mid September, beginning of October. That's what there's uh -huh. all across the country. I mean, even Buffalo has a massive uh, theater opening week. You know, shows popping up everywhere and parties and things like that. That I got a feeling that's going to happen just like it used to always. And let's just hope people come out for it. You know, that's the thing is hoping people. And I also think, and there's a part of me that also thinks this. There's people are starting to realize, and I hope I'm, I hope I'm right about this, how much they miss the theater, mm -hmm. the ballet, the opera. We have been to a ballet, an opera in over a year and right. have that, that hunger to like, okay, we're going to drop everything and go do that. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping. I don't know, but still we have that fear of everything else, trying well, to get away from that fear. I hope you're right. I, I'm going to recommend it that as you're talking, where a couple of thoughts, and then, you know, I'm not going to keep you that much longer, but what I think is that there must have been some message communicated to people across the world and the government agencies, et cetera, that we're opening no matter what, right? So you start, to, you start to see the news, you know, come out a bit differently. And I'm starting to get invitations for things that are happening in September as yeah. in live. I had to check, double check. I'm like, is this going to be uh, on Zoom or we, you know, and it's yeah, yeah, yeah. live in person and I'm looking at looking at the invitation with the side eye. So obviously the communication must be... Everyone's making their plans now. They have to make their plans now because they have everything set up and ready to go. Don't forget, it's not like you can turn on a switch and be like, okay, we're here. I see. And there's going to be that gradual opening, that gradual, I mean, you can't even get into Europe. I spoke to a choreographer friend of mine, uh, Len Brini, in uh, Greece um, mm -hmm. three, four days ago. Yeah. And she just wanted to know, hey, what's going on in the States? What, what's going on with vaccinations and things like that? And I said, well, let's see, I've been vac fully vaccinated for over a month now. Mm -hmm. Everyone in Florida is ridiculous. Vaccines, just like people just walking down the street giving people vaccines everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's, doing, it's doing a great system here in Florida with the uh -huh. vaccination of people. And, uh, you know, 
no, people are slowing down with the mess and theaters are opening up and things like that. And she says to me, I can't find a vaccine in Greece. No one knows what's going on. Our government has completely failed us. So I'm like, that makes me nervous. That, that's that's been the same across Europe and different countries across Europe. So what's going on? I mean, like, uh, like you said earlier, I've done a lot of work in Europe. And ironically, when my book came out, The Collaboration, that came out at the end of January of last year. Mm -hmm. The pandemic hit, like, you know, the end of February, beginning of March. Right. And I had all these, um, what do you call it, uh, talks. Scheduled. Scheduled for Europe. Mm -hmm. And they were like, it's like, oh. So now I have to get back in touch with those people. Who knows when Europe's going to open back up? Mm -hmm. It is interesting. I, you know, at some point I just say, you know what, it's all going to organically happen because it has to, right? I mean, yeah. you know, it just has to, right? It just can't keep going on and on and on. But I mean, you know, and then the last thing I at least want to bring up is the fact that um, you brought up that you were interested in ethnic music. And the thing I think is fascinating, I'm just going to share this with you, is that um, the proximity of Ireland to Spain, mm -hmm. right? And um, Portugal. And what I learned is that they are, I mean, they are the northern part of Spain, right? And, and Ireland and, and, and Great Britain, there is a relation, or in the past and continues, right? There's a relationship between those two regions, right? So there was a dance company, or there is a dance company that put together a, a piece that visited or revisited this relationship that of, of ships and sailors and, and this sort of thing, it was amazingly well done. It was just incredible. And oh, what I could see is the relationship of the yeah. music, right? Well, so they literally the used bagpipes. Yeah, the, the, history, the history between with that is um, back in the day, hundreds of years ago, uh, the Spanish Armada hmm. went to invade England. They ran into a storm. And that storm pushed them into the Irish Sea. They thought they were landing in England. They actually landed in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the Portuguese and Spanish stuck around after they realized. And then that's how you had that mixture, that cultural mixture between the Spanish and the Irish. Yeah. And that, like I said, it comes out in music. It comes out in, in uh, culture as well. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. incredible. I mean, uh, the, the dance company is Grupo Corpo, and they are in... Uh, Bella Horizonte. I honestly and, think I've heard of them. And they did a piece. I can't remember the piece, but it's incredible. And they have the they have the um, the kilts. They have their version of what the kilts. They they really do it from top to bottom. I think it's one of the best productions I have seen um, with regard to bringing these two. Mm -hmm. Or I'd say melding or showing or showcasing. The coming cultures. together of, of two different cultures. Oh, yeah. And and, if, and yeah. That's why I wanted, I mean, the show I've wanted to do forever uh, <laughs> is, is, is somewhat similar to that, but that brought it to so many different, more cultures and mm -hmm. having them beat up each other. You know, it's like I said, you, you, you know, simple flow. That's the one thing that I thought with Riverdance, I would have changed a little. Riverdance was amazing, but it was like performance, then another performance, and then another performance. It never really mm -hmm. blended in with each other. Yeah. I want to do something where the whole performance is one giant blending in of different cultures, in and out, in and out, in and out, yeah. so it just flows. Well, that's a whole nother level, right? Because, like, I, I mean, it's another level. With the river dance, they, they were able to package that, right? And yeah. Because the moment that the big producer from, you know, is a Euro song, whatever, that they made that call to the people in Las Vegas, whatever, I mean, those guys... I assume their job is to somehow boil it down so that it becomes a cookie cutter thing yeah. that they can take, yeah. you know, from place to place. Look, I'll, I'll give you these two other things, just observations off the top of my head. When in the 80s, when flash dance was flash dance was popular and also Footloose and some other shows, right? Who thought that these shows would then become Broadway shows that they literally were cookie cuttering and and passing around the world? Mm -hmm. So literally, it can happen in any form, really. It just means that 
someone has to have the idea and the fortitude to, to, to push it forward. And those movies were so popular, right? They were able to, you know, oh, likewise, yeah. because of the exposure. I mean, is there any film, any piece of entertainment that you've seen that has this ability to be cookie cuttered <laughs> or produced in a, in a big way, you know, because that's what has to happen. Like, even with regard to, let's say, um, there's a dance show that was uh, featured recently called the, um, I don't know what it is, the something of dance, the, the, the boys of dance, the, the man, like they took the male, the strength of the male dancer and sort of the modernization of sort of this modern music. And they literally have these men dancing together, which you don't necessarily see. Call it the bad boys dance or something like this. You, know, you guys, if, if you guys know it, just write in the comments. The bad boys <laughs> dance, right? So, so literally blending sort of this pop music, mm -hmm. right? So every every piece was with pop music, but it was all male company, and they toured that thing. <laughs> they they cookie cuttered that thing. So I I know. In other words, if I see it in Basel, I know that the, it's been masked. Yeah produced right another thing i just want to throw out to you i just want to get your opinion on this i happened to see uh the freddie mercury movie what's mm -hmm. the movie um bohemian rhapsody right Rhapsody. on the plane because i don't go see movies uh, anymore and i don't do netflix but it was so good that i I let me start looking up freddie mercury i mean i knew i know freddie mercury but i had to go back and dig Oh yeah, yeah. So there's scenes there, like, oh, he did that, or he uh, he did that, that, he did that. That was written that way. That came up yeah. with that idea. That's how that idea came out. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. So he he had the ability to collaborate on this in this big way, and he brought the opera singer in. I can't remember. She actually lives in Basel, from what yeah. I understand, and collaborated with her. And apparently, that was a big success. Mm -hmm. Right, but of course, during the process, if you recall in the movie, nobody knew what he was doing. Right, like people yeah. thought it was crazy. But he was able to bring in the elements, and this I saw in a documentary, the elements of the opera with what he was kind of doing as, in rock, mm -hmm. and it ended up being a big deal, right? So, Well, that's the other thing, I, you know, based on what you're saying, is I have a bunch of singer-songwriter students, and I try to push, I'm not pushing them in direction, I'm showing them different directions they can go with their music, mm -hmm. whether musically or the way they sing. And I said, listen, my, my line to them is, okay, there's, I'm sorry, I hate to say this, but there's 10 million of you. Yeah. So you want to stand up. So you know what? Why don't you put this, uh, use this minor nine funk chord in your song, okay? Mm -hmm. Or why don't you take, and I've, I've actually done this as well with one of my students, because he, he's trying to develop different styles of singing, melodies and things like that. So I... I gave him a list of like 50 different scales from different countries, different ethnicities, uh, things like that. Sing through these scales. You know, try if you can inject some of these cultural stuff, their melodies into what you're singing musically. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. That's a, a singer songwriter guy or girl. Wow, he or she's doing something really different. You know, because there, there's enough out there that you can create something different. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's it's a, a fascinating it's a fascinating thing that you do. I think um, you know I want to thank you for um, coming on and speaking with yeah, me about it um, because it's um, you know to a lot of people it's a mystery, right? It's a mystery. It's it's not something that people think about actively when they're going to the theater or they're going to a show. And I think part of what I'm trying to do and what I am doing with this platform, and we spoke about this before we started, is to really present the people, you know, like yourself that are doing this job, right? Mm -hmm. So that people are, you know, they have knowledge, they have educate, they're educated about what it actually takes, right? So I want to thank also you. also what it takes and also educating them to the fact that they want to see more of it. Yeah. Now, okay, now I understand how that happened. Oh, let's have, let's have that happen more often. Because, and I hate to say it, and most nine times out of ten, it's a budgetary thing. People are more apt to grab canned music. I mean, as me as a composer, you know, sure. oh, yeah, I'd love to work with you, but we don't have the budget for that. We're just going to use something from, uh, you know, uh, Tchaikovsky. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and look, it's one of the reasons why you, you in this world, they just repeat everything over and over again, right? So, you know, at some point, New York City Ballet, I'm, I'm calling their name out as a company, they realized they had to start bringing new choreographers in. And that would bring in new, hopefully bring in new music as well, right? So they have this thing called New Works, I think it's coming up that I saw online. Okay. And I'm like, what? Well, because you're, they're doing, they're in the business. And I would even say this, they've been doing the same thing for so long, right? What's got, and, and there are lots of new dancers, students who have graduated in all areas of the arts that are coming in, but they cannot do the same thing over and over again. They just I mean, can't. And how many times are you going to go see the Nutcracker? They can't do, I mean, that, okay, they'll do that over, right? Over and over. But, but they got to do something else, yeah. right? Because... I know for sure I'm not coming if they're going to yeah. continue to do it. I'll tell you straight up, and I support the arts, and everybody knows it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not coming. You know, I need to, if I'm going to spend my money, it better be worth the time. We're competing against social media. I always say this to people now, and it's one of the reasons why we're having the conversation. One last thing I want to bring up. The, the piece that I saw that was really interesting that you did is called, uh, I'm going to spell it out, T-I-M-U-C-U-A, right? Oh, the Timucua piece. Which one was that? That was, that's, that's actually the location. Okay, so I, re, I saw Timucua, Timucua, and there was a piece where you were playing the guitar, and then the woman in the back was painting. And yes, yes. Yeah. So what, what I mean, uh, I don't know if I can oh, pull that okay, video. So, or... I saw, and you know, when I was, um, after purchase, yeah. I, and I, I, was, I was moved to Ireland to go do my uh, grad school work. Uh, I had to take out a loan and uh, to pay the bills, obviously. And uh, I used some of that loan money on a 12-string guitar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I like the sound of 12-string guitar. And I kept playing it and playing it and playing it and just writing scores after scores after scores after scores of 12-string guitar music. Mm -hmm. uh, I put up two different records with it and toured all over the country, um, just playing instrumental, 12-string. Some people might call it contemporary classical music. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you saw. Uh, Tim McQua is a um, Native American um, people down here in Florida, and there's a venue called Tim McQua. It's a uh, guy who opened up his house and built a, a concert venue in his house for artists as well. So he has a lot of live concerts in there. And the one you saw was a video of me playing where the, the woman behind me was actually painting. And I don't have, can't see it from here, but she made this huge painting of me actually playing that concert live. Okay. So, yeah. Well, very good. I mean, look, I, I'm not going to keep you any longer. I think, it, you know, we've, we've actually gone much longer than I expected. But I mean, there were things that kept popping up in my hand. I was like, well, I'm going to ask him about this, right? Yeah, you know, like it's, it's related to what you're up to, right? I mean, we, we, we kind of went off on some tangents, but I think it's important that people to see the connection between what you do and, you know, what is out there for people to consume. Yeah? I yeah, appreciate it, too. Sometimes. Yeah, is there anything else you'd like to add uh, before we close? Or Oh, um, I'm a writer. I write scores. Uh, if anyone out there is interested in my scores, oh, you can go to my, visit my website, uh, damiensimon.net, D-A-M-I-E-N-S-I-M-O-N.net. You can visit me, my website there. And I'm also all over social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, everything. So okay. please well, come and say, send me a note and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you we're, we're gonna get this going it may take me a while to get this all uh, you know piece together but uh, it will we'll put it up and then we'll we'll push it out there and see what happens thank you very much no problem. and uh we will talk soon okay all right thanks all right